The entire point of the original trilogy is saving Anakin's soul, and the prequels add extra emphasis to his importance. If the events of the sequels don't directly follow from that fateful moment when Anakin dies and becomes one with the Force, then the saga has failed storytelling 101. The elegance of this theory is simple to grasp. Anakin was, himself, balanced at the end of Return of the Jedi. Because he had become balanced, he was now within a position to extend that balance to the Force. All this theory suggests, at its most fundamental level, was that Anakin bringing balance to the Force was him seeking out his other half once dead, apologizing for being a little shit, and telling her, I give up my power to you so that we are equals, let's go fix the mess we started. Anakin fulfilled his promise to save Padme from death, and in true mythic irony, it was a play on his delusion in Episode 3. Anakin, all I want is your love. Love won't save you, Padme. Only my new powers can do that. Turns out, love could and did eventually save her. Anakin's love of her, her love of him, Luke's love of Anakin, and Anakin's love of Luke, all combined to give us the ending we see in Return of the Jedi. It can't be a coincidence that we finally have our first example of two completely equal Force users, when Anakin's entire purpose was to bring balance to the Force. And all this theory does is propose that their intertwined destinies reaches back to their days in the prequels. If we look at the entire saga from the perspective of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, we see that Anakin's death should go right about here. His and Padme's story wasn't over yet. I suspect that the resurrection bit happens in The Last Jedi, when Kylo and Rey have some sort of shared vision or experience that clues them into why they exist. Whether this revelation breaks past the Skywalker family, I'm not so sure. And as for Rey's parentage question, this theory can work regardless if she has parents or not. It's really about the spirits of Anakin and Padme entering new bodies, not so much about how they did so. I'd like to think she's like Wonder Woman, created from pure force, but even if she has two flesh and blood parents, this theory can still be true. Perhaps her parents will be revealed to be from the Naboo, which would cement these parallels and make this a valid interpretation. Only the film will tell. Remember I said we'd go back to the island of Octo? Well, let's discuss some mythic symbolism associated with that whole setting. Firstly, temples. I'd like to read to you another Campbell quote about the supposed first temple in the world. Apparently the cave, as literal fact evoked, in the way of a sign stimulus, the latent energies of that other cave, the unfathomed human heart, and what poured forth was the first creation of a temple in the history of the world. A temple is the projection into earthly space of the house of myth. These Paleolithic temple caves were the first realizations of this kind, the first manifestations of the fact that there is a readiness in man's heart for the supernormal image, and in his mind and hand the capacity to create it. Here, therefore, nature supplied the catalyst, a literal, actual presentation of the void. And when the sense of time and space was gone, the visionary journey of the seer began. This means the first Jedi temple and its cavernous interior should serve as some sort of catalyst for a time-shattering, revelation-revealing journey or vision that reveals some truth about the saga that has been previously concealed. Secondly, islands. In mythology, isles and islands are typically the dwellings of immortals. Think of the Odyssey. Oceans and bodies of water represent the unconscious, the power of creation, and many other things, so an island being surrounded by the stuff has always been a strong mythic image. Thirdly, trees. Trees in mythology have represented all the most important things. The knowledge of good and evil, the tree of immortal life, the world axis, etc. Almost every culture uses the image of a tree in its mythology. Trees have typically represented all the deepest mysteries surrounding pairs of opposites, such as good and evil, death and life, light and dark, etc. And just as a tree reaches high into the sky and deep below the earth, so too does the symbol represent the truth and knowledge that goes beyond thinking in terms of one opposite or another. Look at this page from Joseph Campbell's Occidental Mythology. He's talking about the meeting of a young couple in a mythic tree, from the Minoan Culture Center. The Minoans were an ancient civilization that existed on the island of Crete, south of Greece. In the first compartment, the Minoan goddess is seated and in conversation with her partner. The butterflies above represent that they are still in their pupil, which is to say, pre-transformation forms. The two youthful figures next to them are symbolic of the reanimation after death, which is to say, a resurrection. The woman, surprised, is backed against the trunk of the tree. She raises both hands. The man responds by raising the lower part of his right arm. The explanation of this entire scene is as follows. We see here, reunited by the life-giving power of the goddess and symbolized by the chrysalises and butterflies, a young couple whom death had parted. The meeting indeed may, in view of the scene of initiation depicted below, be interpreted as the permanent reunion of 
of a wedded pair in the land of the blessed. So what we have with the first Jedi temple, the island, and the tree with its cavernous interior are all the mythic elements we need for a truly shocking revelation regarding the past and regarding the entire philosophy of this saga. And for me, the most common sense answer to that lies in Anakin and Padme's relationship, where it went wrong and how it will go right this time around. Whatever happens in that tree is going to blow us away, which is probably why they've decided to keep it such a secret in the marketing. Let's touch on Snoke's line in the trailer where he says, fulfill your destiny, probably to Kylo Ren. Within the context of this theory, what Snoke is telling Kylo Anakin is that the only way to become what he was meant to be is to kill Padme Rey, which is an awful lot like an inversion of what Palpatine tells Anakin. Only then will you be strong enough with the dark side to save Padme. But what was Anakin meant to be? Episode 1 tells us. A loving individual who knew nothing of greed. That's all the Force Incarnate has had to learn this entire time. To be a good person. This is why Kylo Ren will become Ben Solo again. He will betray his false master and save Padme Rey so that she, in turn, can save the entire galaxy, just as she was always meant to do. At this point, you may be thinking, this all sounds good, but is there any foreshadowing beyond mythic interpretations of these scenes? A few things are curious in my mind. The rebellion symbol is a starbird, based on Sabine Wren's design. According to the legend, whenever people think the starbird is gone, it's actually being reborn in the heart of a nova. It's the Star Wars version of the phoenix. The Jedi symbol also has bird imagery associated with it as well. What's more, the entire backdrop of Rey and Kylo's duel in The Force Awakens is a battle over a weapon that consumes a star that ends up getting reborn after the Resistance victory. Starkiller Base is a larger metaphor for this entire story. It uses the weapon of the sun, much like what Han knows Snoke is doing with Ben. This look is Kylo finally accepting who Rey is, and when this happens and she wins the fight, the light is reborn within Kylo's heart, represented externally as the birth of the new sun. To add to this, the Aftermath books give us this notion that the Acolytes of the Beyond really believe Vader has been reborn. There's also this mysterious Project Resurrection that is somehow tied up in all of this, so it's at least clear that this imagery as well as the idea of something coming back from the dead has a role within the story. Let's go even further back for clues, all the way to Padme's visual design in Episode 1. The Art of the Phantom Menace book tells us that Padme's design is based off Tibetan Buddhism. Her state name of Amidala is just a word scramble of Dalai Lama, who is Tibet's central figure that is believed to be reincarnated. She is pictured in Episode 1 wearing a dress that is symbolic of a phoenix fire, and furthermore the name Padme carries a lot of meaning as well. It's derived from the Sanskrit mantra Om Mani Padme Hum, which also contains a kernel of Anakin's name. What that effectively means is the jewel in the lotus, so this is a good time to display the image of Lakshmi again. That's a lotus she's standing on. I've placed a link to an image thread I made talking about names in Star Wars and what they possibly mean, so please go ahead and check that out. Padme is the lotus, it's what the name means after all. And curiously, look at this deleted scene from the Mortis arc of the Clone Wars. We stand before you, disciples of the dark side, intent on its supremacy. It has been foreseen that one lives who will control the universe. Where? It is unknown, but know this, the Chosen One is the key. He who controls Skywalker will control everything. We tell you this to guarantee your success. And if I fail... Some of the biggest visual clues we have that reveal this grand story to us are in the solar bodies themselves. Suns and moons appear in critical scenes of the saga. The mythological systems in which the ever-dying, ever-resurrected gods played a huge role almost always assign the sun and the moon to these two deities as symbols. The waxing and waning of the moon, as well as the fact that the sun descends each night and rises each day, has been associated with the theme of death and rebirth for thousands of years. In some beliefs, the sun and moon are chasing each other because they love each other so much, and an eclipse is a moment when they finally meet again. So watch out for an eclipse on Octo if Kylo goes there to pursue Rey. But interestingly, an old prophecy that was scrapped for the original trilogy referred to Luke as the Son of Suns. Always two, there are. That goes for these eternal chosen ones as well, Anakin and Padme. When Luke looks at the binary sunset in A New Hope, that yearning he feels is connected to his destiny. A destiny that involves making his family whole again. That includes his mother. Leia, do you remember your mother? Your real mother? Just a little bit. She died when I was very young. What do you remember? Just images, really. Feelings. Tell me. She was very beautiful. Kind, but sad. 
Why are you asking me this? I have no memory of my mother. I never knew her. Luke, tell me, what's troubling you? The person who edited that clip of Leia and Luke meeting their mother for the first time also discovered that if you take Luke's binary sunset and Rey's son on Jakku flipped, you get a perfectly self-contained yin yang symbol. Whoa. And to take this even further, the original ending of this story revealed that the lead female character was in fact a goddess, and the protagonists realized that they had been adventuring with demigods the entire time. There are a lot more clues than this, but I don't want to focus so much on that, just big ideas. If the theory proves to be true, there will be a lot more videos to come. Until then, let's talk a little bit more about Campbell. He paints an interesting view of the historical development of mythology. In primitive mythology, he talks a great deal about how humankind viewed the divine as being in every tree, rock, and animal. The divine was imminent in all things, which jives well with the descriptions we have of the Force so far. In the first city-states and agricultural civilizations, the mother goddess played a prominent, if not the most important role in the pantheon, for reasons discussed earlier in this video. But as Campbell's story moves along, a curious thing happens. Those early civilizations in India and the Near East, who placed the mother goddess at the center of their pantheons, were overran by nomadic hunter peoples who had a very patriarchal set of gods, in which a father god was usually the big deal. And nowhere is this shift towards the father aspect more apparent than in Christianity and Islam. And like any conquest, the gods and beliefs of the conquered people were incorporated, but in a way that reinforced the conquest. The mother goddess typically became a titan, someone that had to be overthrown because she was oppressive. And as these more patriarchal systems matured, divinity became something that was further and further away from being present in all things, to being purely and only found in that father of all that resides in heaven. This material world of nature became something to be despised and detested, something that we had to win spiritual freedom from. If we look at Star Wars from the point of view of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, which Ryan Johnson alluded to still mattering, we can try to make some solid predictions. The first threshold is the death of Anakin and birth of Vader, which coincides with the death of the Republic and birth of the Empire. The second threshold is the exact midpoint of the entire saga, where Luke learns Vader is his father, which is where the story also reverses and the fate of Anakin changes as well. The third threshold is the death of Vader and rebirth of Anakin Skywalker being one with the Force, where he can now, with the wisdom gained in life, complete the final phase of his journey. On this diagram, Rey and Kylo's first duel is the showdown, their rebirth is in The Last Jedi, and the return with Elixir and Crossing of the Fourth and Final Threshold occurs in Episode 9. Based on this, I do expect some of this theory to be basically confirmed in The Last Jedi. The Elixir, to me, will be what the female principle in the saga has always tried to teach. Unconditional love, boundless compassion, a willingness to fight for others who can't fight for themselves, and wisdom to differentiate right from wrong. Shmi, Padme, and Leia have represented these attributes like no other characters have. And so Rey is a culmination of all of this, focused and channeled into a single character, who ultimately is going to be the one in Episode 9 that restores peace, justice, and freedom to the galaxy. There's so much meaning in this story if this turns out to be the case that I can't possibly hope to cover it all here. If it's correct, I could make a dozen or more videos picking it apart. But since there is a strong chance it is not correct, I will wait until The Last Jedi releases to see if it's worth pursuing. And there are a lot of ways that this can be basically confirmed in the film as well, without a literal confirmation. For example, if Rey's parents are from the Naboo, that basically seals the deal for me. If Luke or some other character says that Rey and Ben are equals because Anakin gave up some of his power, it also seals the deal for me. I would prefer for the audience to know the cold hard truth of the matter, but there are levels of confirmation I'm prepared to accept. I'm excited to find out how this all falls together. I apologize for the rushed nature of this video. This idea is just so big, and I had a lot of real life responsibilities, so I couldn't make it what I wanted it to be. I still hope that it made you think about the story in a new way, and ultimately, I just hope it makes you even more excited for The Last Jedi. I'll be back with my thoughts on the film shortly after its release. Until then, try not to die from excitement waiting.